Hello, good morning. I hope that everybody is well and that you've had a good week. Um, going back to uh, last week's video, um, when I uh, mentioned scarves, well, <laughs> I have had loads of emails this week with um, people sending me in photographs of their scarves and matching them up to Vera Soise 103 silks. Um, I, I've really, really enjoyed uh, those uh, emails and seeing those photographs. And um, I had um, a couple of people ask me, what is my favourite uh, way of tying a scarf? So, um, when I got dressed this morning, I thought rather than put my scarf on upstairs in uh, front of my dressing table, I would put my scarf on down here um, and show you how uh, I tied my um, scarf today. As I've got older, I find that um, I wear more and more scarves. Um, one thing is I've got a neck injury and a scarf makes my neck feel nice and warm and secure. But what I have found with a scarf, um, it can add a lot to my appearance, uh, both in my mind and visually. As I've got older, my skin tone has changed and my hair has gone grey. And it's very easy to become a grey figure, but a scarf can add colour. And especially as a scarf is around your face, um, a bright, cheery scarf can make you look happy. Um, a bold, sassy scarf can boost your confidence. Um, today's scarf um, is this one, and I just love the colours in this. Um, now, um, tying scarves, if you go onto YouTube, there are hundreds and hundreds of videos of how to tie scarves, and some of them are really inventive. Um, but I like to keep my scarves relatively simple. And one of my favourite ways of tying a scarf is to uh, put it into a triangle just by folding the corners. So there's my triangle. And then I like to just gather the top a little bit. So I'm reducing the size of the uh, triangle. And then just wrapping it around my neck. And then I'm just going to tie a double knot. There we go. This is really odd doing this anywhere other than my dressing table, the mirror above my dressing table. Um, I don't know if you find this, but when I go on holiday, um, I always find it really difficult to do my makeup um, in a different place. We all get used to doing things, and it's a bit like stitching really, I stitch best in my little uh, stitching nest. So with a scarf, it's just like arranging um, a flower display. You have to tweak and you have to fiddle a little bit. I don't like that label showing. There we are. Now, just to give this a little bit more style, I'm going to move it to the side. and let that one fall over my shoulder. So that's my scarf for the day. And what you mustn't do is over fiddle, which is one of my biggest downfalls, and spoil the effect that you create. So that's my scarf. For well, that the day. is different from a normal needlework video. Um, okay, so needlework. Well, um, we've had two releases this week, um, just the way it happened to come about. Um, the first release 
is the beautiful, beautiful, stunning uh, Ruth Bates. Now, um, Ruth's sampler was stitched by Lisa Brown, and um, Lisa poured her heart and soul into this model and really did a beautiful job stitching Ruth. Uh, now it's a very dark overcast day, it's raining outside, so I don't know how the light is uh, for you. But this is a gorgeous sampler. Really, really beautiful. Look at that undulating two-tone um, sort of border. Very, very beautiful. And then you will see Ruth Bates, aged eight years old. Isn't that an amazing achievement for an eight-year-old? Like, she was most probably seven when she started this. She may have been coming up to seven because this wouldn't have been stitched in a matter of months. Um, a few hours a day or school days would have been spent on this sampler. Now, um, a lot of you would look at this sampler and say, this reminds me of another sampler from Hands Across the Sea samplers. And you would be right. This sampler is so much like um, Isabella Uffendel. And um, here is um, Isabella's uh, sampler. And you can see there are so many similarities. And to um, Anne uh, Tom Uffendel's sampler as well. But it's Isabella's that it really hits you. Um, and if you were um, one of the fortunate people that um, have a copy of the original um, booklet, the joint production, um, you would have seen the original of this sampler. So um, if you look in your book, I need my glasses. Let's put them on. Um, where is it? There we are. This is the original Ruth Bates. Um, and Ruth Bates came into my life when um, the sisters were being stitched and I was researching um, the Uffendale sisters. And um, for those of you who have this book, you would have read um, about the connection. But um, basically, I believe that um, Ruth Bates' aunt, Elizabeth Bates, taught Ruth and taught Isabella and Anne Uffendell to stitch. And um, it's really surprising um, how one thing leads to another. Um, this sampler came up for auction, I saw it, I thought this has to be connected with the Uffendells and I just decided to buy it. And the original sampler, you know, um, it's, it was old, it was dirty, um, it had holes in it, but I still wanted to have it because I just felt there was this connection to the Uffendells. Um, when I was researching Ruth's family tree, I came across uh, her aunt's name, Elizabeth Bates, and I knew I'd seen Elizabeth Bates, um, that name, and um, I went back through my notes and Yes, Elizabeth Bates was on the census return living with the Uffendells. And this is um, a classic example of when you're doing research, always go to the source document. When I pulled up the Uffendells in the census, um, for those of you who research, you know that um, Ancestry give you a transcription and they show everybody who was living in the household. But when I looked at the original um, source document, which was a photocopy of the actual census, you could see 
that Elizabeth Bates lived with the Uffendales as well, and that was missed off Ancestry's uh, transcription. So um, that's how we know that Elizabeth Bates is the connection between the Uffendales and Ruth Bates. Um, when um, I bought Ruth Bates, I wrote to the auctioneers and I asked them if they would send a letter on to the owner of Ruth Bates. And they very kindly did. And the owner immediately contacted me. Um, she herself was a um, medieval archivist, so she could understand my interest in researching uh, Ruth's history and um, she told me that uh, the family had connections with the law going back many many years and she was right. Um, Ruth came from a very long line of um, attorneys, solicitors, lawyers, you know there's lots of terms that you can use for somebody who's qualified to practice law. Um, we know that um, Ruth was a non-conformist because her birth was registered at the Dr. Williams' library. And this is very interesting for uh, people who like to research their family history. Um, Dr. Williams' library was founded in 1729 and it has the largest collection of English non-conformist material in the world. And it said that amongst its aims was that for a small fee it kept a central registry of births mainly within non-conformist families, thus avoiding the necessity of having to have a child baptised in an Anglican church when you were not of the Anglican faith. And there were some 50,000 non-conformist births were recorded there prior to compulsory law requiring the registration of births, marriages and deaths in 1836. So that's a very um, interesting source if you are uh, researching your family history in England. Um, now, we know that Ruth came from a fairly well-to-do, middle-class family, but her father died when uh, his family were, were young, and we know that her mother moved from Plaistow, um, close to where the Uffendales lived, and probably the reason that she moved was because she was moving into an area where many non-conformists lived. So she was m moving amongst um, her own people and where she would have the support of her church. And at that time, although she had an annuity, she probably was living um, in reduced circumstances and Ruth um, and her sisters had to do some kind of work. And I believe that Ruth um, practiced millinery. She made hats. Um, Elizabeth Bates as an unmarried uh, sister, had probably lived with her brother's family. And when he died, it probably necessitated her having to look for work. And um, she probably taught uh, in the area of where she was living with the Uffendales. If you were a non-conformist, whether you were like a Quaker or a Presbyterian, and I believe these people were um, Quakers, um, you know, you wanted a governess that was of the same faith as you. Um, Ruth met and married Henry Child, who was a widower, and he was a wealthy man. Um, you know, he had a very successful law practice and he had lots of children and Ruth went on to have um, lots of children with um, Henry. Um, 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 I did say in here how many children, let me just find it. Um, she bore Henry nine children and she died in 1870 at age 50. Um, 
Henry lived until uh, 1882 and his probate records reveal that at the time of his death, um, his estate was worth, in today's money, £3.5 million. Pounds. So they, you know, they, they, they lived a well-to-do lifestyle. Um, and there are other things that we found when we were searching Ruth. And it's all um, in um, the um, write-up that comes with the PDF. You've got quite a few pages. Now, um, Ruth's sampler. Well, the original sampler um, is 11.75 inches by 15.25 inches. So the sampler was stitched on 50, 52 uneven linen. Um, so, you know, if you want to stitch Ruth's sampler the same size, um, go for 50, 52 um, linen. Now, Ruth's original sampler has been sold and I am so thrilled where this sampler has gone. Um, when I finished reproducing the Uffindels, they were sold on to a store owner and that store owner has subsequently uh, sold the Uffindel sisters to a needle worker who is also a collector of antique samplers and she is a very good friend of mine um, and um, when I learned that um, she ha now had the original sisters um, I said to her, you know, you really ought to have Ruth Bates and she agreed with me so Ruth Anne and Isabella are all together and I think that's um, really, really nice. Um, it's the best outcome for the three samplers. Um, samplers have a way of finding um, their owners and um, Ruth Sampler has come back uh, to be with um, two other girls that wouldn't have sat and stitched their samplers at the same time as Ruth because there is a difference in their ages. But, you know, they, I'm sure they were taught by Elizabeth Bates. Um, okay, so the, um, if you want to stitch Ruth, and I know that many of you want to, you want to hang her with your sister samplers. Um, she uses cross stitch over two and one and satin stitch and you know she is beyond you know she's suitable for um intermediate and advanced stitches but she's not beyond a determined beginner and um, she's a big sampler so there's a lot of stitching but you know if you want to stitch this sampler you can stitch her um she was um stitched um Hold on a second, I did. But, you know, I'm all over the place today. Yes, she was stitched uh, on Weeks Dye Works 46 count Swigart base linen in parchment, and we used Overa Soir's uh, Soir d'Alge uh, because we wanted her to be stitched in the same silks as um, the Uffindels, and in particular for Lisa. Lisa stitched Anne, uh, the model for Anne. So uh, Ruth will um, hang with um, Anne and also Jay Lee who stitched Isabella has gifted Isabella to Lisa so the three models are going to hang together in Lisa's home and I think that's absolutely wonderful as well so anyway I was digressing then so we used Soir d'Alge and it's 24 colours. Um, in the PDF download, I give you the varying quantities for um, Soir um, 103, um, Soir d'Alge DMC with one and two strands over varying counts of linen. Um, what we would suggest, there is some over one on this sampler and that is the verse and the dedication and we would recommend that you use um, 103 for stitching the over one um, if you're using soir d'alger on 
40 count or 46 count. If you were stitching this on 36 count, please do the over one um, in the Soir d'Alger. Um, okay, so that is um, Ruth Sampler. She's available on our website um, for instant download via PDF and there are some selective stores um, that have access to the PDFs as well. Um, if you're looking for a, a printed uh, copy of the PDF, uh, Hobby House Needleworks and the Attic Needleworks will print the PDFs for you for a small fee to um, cover the cost of printing. She is beautiful. Um, I'll be sorry to see her go. She's going to stay with me just for a little while longer and then she's off to be displayed. Um, okay, so what else happened um, this week? Oh, before I talk about our other release, um, I mentioned about um, swapping out the 103, uh, sorry, the, the Soir d'Alger to 103, and that's one of the really lovely things about Avera Soir's range. Um, you can um, stitch something in um, the Soir d'Alger and then switch it to 103 for the over one, but this week. Um, I've been stitching um, with a um, with Soir 103 and I wanted to do something that was very very fine so I could switch it to the Soir Safine and still match the colours but go finer and I'll talk more about these colours um, in a short while and I'll show you the project that um, I use these colours for. Um, the other new release um, is this beautiful drum. Um, we were so excited um, to uh, release this drum. Um, the little design um, would stand as a sampler in its own right and it's in our garden many flowers bloom. Um, roses, tulips, forget-me-nots, and many others too. Um, and we decided that we wanted to finish this into a drum and the wonderful Faye Rigsby Carolina Stitcher uh, finished uh, this for us. Um, so you could stitch it as a sampler or you can stitch it and add the extra elements which is this lovely little top to the drum. And what we decided that we wanted to do is rather than strawberries, we wanted rosebuds. So um, when you download the PDF um, for uh, this little sampler, you will get um, a chart for the top and for the little rosebuds as well. We love this so much. Um, okay, this was stitched with DMC uh, because, um, again, it's been very, very difficult sending silks um, to Australia. Sometimes parcels have been taking eight weeks, six to eight weeks. They go by ship rather than air. And you know what it's like when you've got a design in your head and you've got it down on a graph, you want to stitch it today. So um, Sandra had the DNC, so she used DNC um, to stitch this. It's available for download um, on our website. And... Um, it only uses cross stitch over two, so you can stitch this on um, Ada, Lin Ada or Ada. Uh, the linen that we used, Wild Honey, is 37 count. If you would like to stitch it on a lower count, Legacy Linen has um, another um, linen which is 30 count, and I always get this wrong, it's either Honey Glaze or Glazed Honey. I'm sorry, it's one of those things that just will not sink into my brain. Um, 
and then they also have a darker a slightly darker version of this linen um, which is in a higher count again um, we used um, nine colors and although it was stitched with um, DMC, we do provide a conversion for Soir d'Alger and Soir 103. And um, we give the linen sizes, uh, we give three lots of um, categories of linen sizes. Um, we give you the size of the linen for the sampler, and then we give you a separate size for the drum top and a separate size for the rosebuds. Now, with the rosebuds, you actually need to stitch four of them, okay, because you need two per rosebud, and they're stitched together to make a 3D rosebud. So the measurement in the PDF is for one rosebud. And your overall size of your linen will depend how you lay those rosebuds out. You know, you might do two and two, or you might do four in a row. Um, so you have the size of one, so you have to work out your overall size of your linen. But the big thing to remember, and Faye has stressed this to us, that when you are finishing the rosebuds, you must have a two inch allowance around each rosebud for finishing. So that's just our little tip um, to make sure that you have enough um, linen for finishing. Um, we're having great fun um, in the last 12 months. Having PDFs have given Sandra and I a f the freedom to explore um, other types of needlework, um, like the small samplers. We couldn't justify um, putting those into a booklet with the price of postage to send them around the world. But with a PDF, we can do that. And again, with um, finishing things off into smalls like um, Tis the Season, the uh, four girls that were made into Christmas ornaments, Spring Violets, that lovely little cushion, and in our garden, the drum. You know, we can release these because PDF makes that feasible. Um, Okie dokie. So, um, you'll notice there's another sampler here and uh, some of you will recognise that this is a sampler that we have reproduced and the sampler is Martha James. Now, um, I'm working my way through my collection having um, the uh, non-reflective uh, glass put into my samplers. And I got uh, Martha back before my uh, framers went into complete lockdown. And I'm really pleased. Um, I had her put in a new frame and um, I had the non-reflective glass. You do get a reflection, but you know, this is very, very good glass. And this glass will protect the sampler from uh, light as well. I love this sampler. Um, there's something about it that makes me feel happy and um, it makes me feel um, light in myself. And I think what it is, is uh, the woman and the little boy wandering along without a care in the world. Um, and that little boy, um, when you're young, you haven't had life's knocks and, you know, you've been leaving Father Christmas. And I just love looking at that scene. You know, there's birds in the air, so there'll be bird song. Um, there are all these beautiful flowers, so you smell the scent of summer on the air. You know, he's got his little spinning top, his toy. She's got a basket full of fruit and flowers. And they're jaunty, they're walking along, enjoying life. I love this sampler so much. 
Um, the uh, my model, which I stitched, um, is on display at the Attic Needleworks, but that is um, a photograph of the model. I love this sampler so much. Um, and the verse is, Fountain of blessing, ever blessed, enriching all of all possessed. Very, very pretty sampler. Um, it's costing me a lot of money having all these samplers and um, reglaze, but it's worth it. It's going to protect um, these samplers for the future. And when you own an antique sampler, you do have a duty of care um, to that little girl that stitched that sampler. And all the generations after that little girl that cherish that sampler, and that's why they're here for us to enjoy today. And if we look after them, they'll be here tomorrow for the generations that come after us. Um, now, where's my stitching? Ah, oh, here it is. I thought I forgot it. Um, this week um, I had a finish. I finished. Um, mini stand lake and I'm really pleased with this little sampler. Um, she didn't believe in spacing so all the words run into each other. Um, her lines are wibbly wobbly where she miscounted and this was stitched on huge, you know, this, this piece, so the count of her fabric was very very low so the original sampler is really big so how she didn't see that she was wandering off her thread. I just don't know. Um, Minnie was obviously a little daydreamer, but this is so pretty. And when this is framed, this is going to be really, really lovely. And it's going to be a splash of a different color for um, my little sampler wall that I'm building. Those are the two colors um, I used from uh, Soir um, 103. Um, very nice co combination, quite patriotic actually, both for um, the US and for us in Great Britain. Um, now, I have done some other stitching and this other stitching that I did was um, done because um, I needed to do something otherwise I was going to scream and stew and um, When something happens that really throws you, you have to um, deal with it in your mind. And a lot of you will know that Hugo's um, planned appointment with the cardiologist this week just gone went pear-shaped. Um, and I was so upset um, about it, ridiculously so really, but I think that we had built ourselves up so much for this um, that when it was um, it didn't go ahead um, it really really threw me so before I talk about the stitching let me talk about Hugo as I've sort of started it um, when our vets um, confirmed that um, Hugo's murmur was getting worse and worse and we, he recommended we go and see a cardiologist we um, researched cardiologist and um, the vet that, um, so the, the specialist vet that my vet recommended um, was a lady who was not only a cardiologist but she had a lot of experience in uh, boxer hearts and she is on the list of approved cardiologists um, that the Boxer Breed Council publishes. And boxers have really funny hearts that have lots of sort of quirks that are related to the breed. Now, if Hugo needed to see an orthopaedic specialist, I would have been happy to see an orthopaedic specialist. But because it was a heart problem, I specifically wanted to see a cardiologist that was experienced in boxers. And this is one of the reasons why the Boxer Breed Council has this list of people that specialise in boxer hearts. So anyway, um, my vet wrote off to um, 
the cardiologist requesting to see this specific vet. When the uh, practice phoned me to make the arrangement, um, I was referring to this cardiologist by name and I, um, you know, as far as I was concerned, I had an appointment to see this particular cardiologist. And I had asked for this cardiologist to ring me before the appointment so that we could have a telephone appointment so I could talk about Hugo because, be, because of COVID, when I went to see, uh, when I went to my vets and she was coming down to do a day's referral in Cornwall, I would not have been allowed to go in. Uh, one of the uh, nurse assistants would have come out, taken Hugo and, and gone in. And I felt that this telephone appointment was very important and I offered to pay for their time. Well, 48 hours before um, Hugo's appointment, I had not received a telephone call. So I decided to phone uh, the cardiologist. Uh, it, and this practice is a practice of cardiologists. And um, I said that this person hadn't phoned me. Anyway, it turned out that my appointment wasn't with this person at all. Because of COVID, they had reorganized their rotor and it was a different cardiologist that was coming on Thursday. And this person was not on the uh, Box of Breed Council's list of approved cardiologists. So um, I made the decision not to see this person and um, I have found out that I can still see the approved cardiologist um, in Cornwall. They will be down in March. So um, all that build up and uh, worry and, and concern sort of boiled over. And it really, really threw me and upset me. But anyway, I'm going to see our vet on February the 11th to get them to check um, Hugo's heart again and to have another talk to them um, and I'll let you know how it goes from there but Hugo he's happy and he's to me he seems healthy you know he's growing he's thriving he's active he can run up a hill without you know well we all puff and huff when we run up a hill but you know he's no tireder than Bertie running up a hill um, so anyway, this week um, I decided I needed something that was just going to uh, take my whole concentration so I stopped thinking about Hugo and my upset over this appointment. So I decided to stitch a sampler on 56 count over one. Madness! So here is my little sampler. Uh, stitched um, over one on 56 count. Um, I like stitching over one and I have stitched over one, um, you know, um, text on 56 count. Now, this is the width of the sampler. There is a little bit more to come underneath, but I feel um, by the end of my stitching session last night, I felt that I had um, worked out um, all that was going on inside my head regarding Hugo. So I'm going to put this to one side now and I'm going to pick back up the new model that I'm stitching on. But what I was going to say was that this is actually a sampler that um, I will be stitching to release four hats, but not over one. The model will be stitched over two. Um, so those are the um, same colours in the uh, Soir 103 range and the Soir Safine. So um, I will at some stage be showing you the proper model, which will be bigger than this, quite a bit bigger, um, stitched over to needlework is such good therapy. It really, really is. Um, you know, rather than have a glass of wine, because I'm not really a drinker, um, I would have had a packet of biscuits or maybe several packets of biscuits and lots of chocolate to get over my, um, 
my turmoil, but I turn to my needle, which is good. Um, okay, um, I think that's probably all uh, for about um, for this week. Um, I hope in the week ahead the weather is going to be better. It has rained and rained and rained and Cornwall is very uh, wet at the moment. We didn't get the snow that the rest of the country got, but we have had a lot of rain. Um, and I love walking and although we walk um, in all sorts of weather because, you know, the dogs don't mind if it's raining, it's much nicer to walk um, in the dry. <laughs> Um, so, um, until next week, um, take care, and if God is kind, um, I'll be back with uh, some more um, ramblings about needlework. Stay well, stay safe. Bye-bye.